A young mother is murdered in front of her children. That poor woman was butchered. It was horrendous. Her millionaire ex-husband is his suspect from the start. He just had that arrogance about him. He can't touch me. He's never going to get me. The investigation grinds on for two years as the suspect spends his days on the golf course. He would always say, well, she'll never leave me because if she does, I'll kill her. Investigate me as much as you want. I had nothing to do with this. This man is a confessed killer. His name is Joey Del Toro. He is 26 years old, and he will be behind bars until he dies. In the fall of 1997, Del Toro slipped into the Florida home of Sheila Bellish, a 35-year-old mother of six. He shot her in the face, sliced her throat twice, and left her to die. I didn't realize what I had done. I knew I had done something wrong, but I hadn't realized what I had done. I just felt numb, like I couldn't feel anything. I asked God, I go, God, why did you not let me die before I had done something like this? There's not a day that goes by that I don't regret everything that I did. On one level, Joey Del Toro is the central character in the story of Sheila Bellish's murder. The man responsible for so savagely ending her life. Yet at the same time, he is just a bit player. One link in a complicated plot that took three long years to untangle and started with the question, why would a 21-year-old from Texas travel over a thousand miles to murder a Florida housewife? Yeah. We're gonna get pictures. In the fall of 1997, Sheila Bellish and her family were starting a new life. To all appearances, they were a typical, if chaotic, household. Sheila and her husband Jamie had their hands full with 23-month-old quadruplets, along with Sheila's two daughters by her previous husband. But their circumstances were anything but ordinary. For nearly a decade, Sheila had been fighting a fierce custody battle with her ex-husband, San Antonio millionaire, Alan Blackthorne. In September, the Bellishes had fled to this quiet subdivision in Sarasota, Florida, in the hopes of severing all ties to him. When we moved to Florida, I knew that we were definitely being very cautious. We tried to keep it between family and friends about where we were going. By November, Sheila and her family had settled into a comfortable routine. On the afternoon of Friday the 7th, 13-year-old Stevie Bellish was rushing home to tell her mother about a blossoming junior high crush. I had like this extra jump in my step, and I was just going to tell her about everything that happened at school that day. When Stevie walked in the house, she thought it was unusual that the quadruplets were sitting in the hallway crying. So I called my mom's name. She didn't answer. Stevie headed toward the laundry room, but stopped when she reached the kitchen. I saw, like, the trail of blood and the clothes everywhere and just the complete disarray of the kitchen. Her mother lay motionless on the floor, surrounded by a drying pool of blood. I bent down and actually, like, looked at her, and I, like, I touched her face. I kind of wanted to pick her up and hold her. I was like, no, I can't hold her. I can't touch anything. The distraught teenager called 911. Your mom what? Okay, what makes you think that? Blood all over the place. She has a cut on her neck. Oh my God! The 911 operator dispatched police and tried to calm Stevie. Okay, Stevie, we have help on the way. Okay. <laughs> 
At the scene, officers found no signs of a burglary. But the pattern of smeared blood on the floor and walls indicated that there had been a struggle. Sarasota County Detective Chris Iorio was one of the policemen who responded to the dispatch. We had uh, blood everywhere. It was pretty uh, obvious to us that there was a conflict that started uh, somewhere in the laundry room area and progressed out into the kitchen. The four toddlers had apparently witnessed their mother's murder and been home alone with her body for more than six hours. When the deputies first got there, they thought maybe the kids were injured because they did have blood on them. It was later determined that they were just walking around in their mother's blood. Jamie Bellish telephoned Sheila's sister in Salem, Oregon with the news. He told me that um, my sister had been killed and I told him that he was a liar. And uh, then he just sat there and didn't say anything. And then it sunk in. At the crime scene, Stevie Bellish told detectives who she believed killed her mother. She said, my dad did this, Alan Blackthorn. We had no reason to believe he was in the area, but we kept that in the back of our mind. Police continued to gather evidence. The killer had left behind a bloody fingerprint on the clothes dryer and a bullet shell casing from a 45 caliber automatic pistol. But the most valuable information was given to detectives by a vigilant neighbor. Earlier that day, the neighbor had seen a suspicious man leaving a sports car parked around the corner from the Bellish home. He had a license plate of a car that he had seen in the area. He did write it down, which was a huge break for us. Within two days, detectives had traced the license plate and fingerprints to a 21-year-old from southern Texas named Joey Del Toro. Sarasota authorities immediately contacted the Texas Rangers to assist with the investigation. Sergeant Gerardo De Los Santos was assigned to the case. Initially, when they said that the suspect was from the, the Texas area, uh, the first thought that came to mind, maybe it could be the ex-husband. But there was no firm connection between Del Toro and Alan Blackthorn. Nor was there anything in Del Toro's background to indicate that he'd commit such a crime. His only significant prior conviction was for shoplifting. He was not a big-time criminal. A lot of girls, uh, excellent football player, uh, good-looking kid. That's basically what was coming from Joey Del Toro. It didn't take long for detectives to track down Del Toro's car, which was parked at his girlfriend's house in Austin. Inside the car, they discovered a wealth of evidence. The address and directions to the Bellish home, the camouflage clothing Del Toro had been seen wearing, and a 45 caliber handgun. We found his clothing with blood on it. We found uh, some of Sheila's blood on the upholstery in the car. Just about everything you'd want to find, we found, which was nice. It was unreal. He was just leaving evidence everywhere. Yet the suspect himself was nowhere to be found. Detectives interviewed dozens of Del Toro's friends and family members, including his cousin, a 27-year-old golf caddy named Sammy Gonzalez. Gonzalez admitted that he had driven Del Toro to a San Antonio bus terminal and said that his cousin was headed for the Mexican border town of Laredo. But that was hardly the end of his story. Sam was interviewed three or four times. Every time we, he interviewed, he gave a little bit more until he eventually told the whole story. In a taped confession, Gonzalez revealed that he had helped arrange the murder of Sheila Bellish. And he confirmed the detective's suspicions that Joey Del Toro was the hitman. Tell me what you know about this incident. It's supposed to be just a beating and, and not knowing about the killing was supposed to be occurred. I not saw the news and was kind of uh, sad about it and disgusted about it. Who committed this murder? Well, said Del Toro. When he was supposed to go down there and uh, speed her up. By the time he was done, Gonzalez would shed light on the events leading up to Sheila Bellish's murder and send investigators down a trail that seemed to lead in one direction. 
In November 1997, San Antonio golf caddy Sammy Gonzalez told authorities that he had helped arrange the brutal slaying of 35-year-old Florida homemaker Sheila Bellish. In exchange for a reduced prison sentence, Gonzalez fingered his cousin Joey Del Toro as the hitman and recounted for police Del Toro's gruesome depiction of the crime. Gonzalez had already helped his cousin flee to Mexico, but he did give investigators the name of another man who he said had coordinated the attack. A small-time San Antonio gambler named Danny Rocha. Rocha first contacted Sammy to actually go and beat up Sheila initially. Once Sammy found out it was a woman, he did not want to do it. But he came up with, it, with the idea, well, maybe my cousin Joey would do it. Gonzalez then provided police with an even more important piece of information. He mentioned that Danny Rocha was golfing buddies with someone named Alan. Investigators were convinced that Alan had to be Alan Blackthorne, Sheila Bellish's ex-husband. His daughters confirmed that he and Danny Rocha were friends. When I heard Rocha, I was like, wait, I know him. And I saw this picture, and I was like, I'm like, I've played with his kids before. In fact, police discovered Rocha had been golfing with Blackthorne on the day Sheila Bellish was killed. On November 17th, Danny Rocha was arrested at his home and charged with conspiracy to commit murder. From the beginning, he denied any involvement and refused to cooperate with authorities. Meanwhile, investigators continued to pursue who they believed had masterminded the murder. The man Sheila Bellish's family had suspected from the start, Alan Blackthorne. I knew it had to be Alan, so... He was somehow behind it. Right away, I was like, it was my dad, wasn't it? He didn't have to pull the trigger to cause the action. In a later television interview, Blackthorne defiantly maintained his innocence. Investigate me as much as you want. I had nothing to do with this. But as detectives dug into Sheila and Alan's past, they came to see her murder as the final act in a spiraling saga of domestic vengeance. Sheila Walsh met Alan Blackthorne in Salem, Oregon, when she was 19. He was 27 and already going through his second divorce. Crime author Ann Rule spent a year and a half researching Sheila's life for a book she wrote on the case. He was every girl's ideal boyfriend. He was good-looking, he was smooth and seemingly successful, charismatic. The only one who really didn't like him was her sister Carrie, who saw something behind the perfect mask in Alan. He seemed like a really nice, likable guy, but then he had a very bad temper, and he was really quick to anger. By their third date, the couple was engaged. They married in February 1983. It seemed like a happy union. Over the next three years, Sheila would give birth to two daughters, Stevie and Daryl. Alan started a business importing electronic muscle stimulators, and he always managed to find time for his favorite pastime, golf. I never really ever saw Alan work. He was a golfer. I mean, he was always golfing and always talking about golfing. By 1986, the Blackthorns had moved to San Antonio, Texas, and Alan and Sheila's relationship had started to crumble. More and more often, Sheila found herself on the receiving end of Alan's violent temper. She learned really quick that she fought back, then she usually got hurt, or she got the bad end of it. He would grab her by the collar and lift her up against the wall. For Alan, it was all about control. He felt like Sheila was his. He would always say, well, Sheila will never leave me because if she does, I'll kill her. On two occasions, Blackthorne was charged with battery for assaulting Sheila. Both times, he paid a fine and received probation. She was only in her early 20s, and she looked like she was in her 40s. Finally, after four years, 
Sheila had had enough. She filed for divorce in October 1987, and her petition was granted a year later. When she did finally leave him, she said to me, it was either stay in the marriage and have him kill me that way, or leave and have a fighting chance. But the end of the marriage was only the beginning of the war. Over the next few years, Blackthorne would file multiple petitions, claiming his child support payments were too high, even as his business boomed, eventually making him a millionaire. He carried thousands of dollars in his wallet at a time, and he just liked the power of showing people, look how much money I have. In 1993, Blackthorne got married for a fourth time. He and his wife Maureen had two sons and moved into a lavish mansion in suburban San Antonio. Sheila, meanwhile, had met and married a 31-year-old pharmaceutical salesman named Jamie Bellish. In 1995, she became a local celebrity when, through in vitro fertilization, she gave birth to quadruplets. But while her life seemed to be looking up, the courtroom combat continued. I think that Sheila thought that when she married Jamie, you know, finally she would have somebody that would kind of help her fight the battle but it didn't get any better. Then, in the summer of 1997, Sheila went on the offensive. She filed charges against Alan, claiming that years before, he had sexually abused their daughter, Stevie, now 13 years old. But the case never went to court. Sheila dropped the charges when Alan unexpectedly agreed to give up all parental rights to Stevie and Daryl. I think she felt more threatened after he relinquished his parental rights because she knew she had won the ultimate battle as far as he was concerned. Having lost the custody fight, Alan now tried a different tactic. He convinced 12-year-old Daryl to press charges after an argument with her mother left her with a bruised leg. I talked to my dad and he's like, well, you know what, that's beating and that's child abuse. And he's like, you should call the police. Sheila was arrested and had to be bailed out of jail. Daryl now says her father manipulated her into accusing her mother. When you can look back on it and you see really what happened, you know, it was I got punished for something that I did wrong that I deserved. In September 1997, the Bellish family abruptly moved to Sarasota, Florida leaving no forwarding address. Blackthorne would later claim that their departure made no impact on him. I went out of my way to make sure that I had little to no contact. I didn't want any contact. I had moved on with my life. Police looking into Sheila's murder, however, had a very different view. They saw her sudden departure as the insult that pushed Alan Blackthorne over the edge. He hated to lose. I think the final straw was when he gave her parental rights and Sheila walked away with the kids. She had won, and that really, really got to him. And I think at that point he began a terrible plot to destroy Sheila. When we finally got into the investigation, uh, everything led back to Alan Blackthorne. Blackthorne had maintained his innocence from day one. In a later interview with a Tampa TV station, he said he first learned of his ex-wife's murder from the evening news and was shocked to hear he was a suspect. We turned on the news and the announcer came on and said, Sarasota police say the ex-husband did it. The search is on for the ex-husband. At that point, I mean, not only are you just kind of dumbfounded, but Maureen said, you know what, we better get a lawyer. Alan was obviously upset about it and obviously nervous about it, but knew that he had nothing to do with it and didn't feel that ultimately uh, anything bad would happen to him as a result of it. While Blackthorne kept up his five-day-a-week golfing schedule, police intensified their efforts to link him to the murder. The challenge was now to find evidence to connect it to, whether that be bank records, through phone toll records, interviewing other people, uh, witnesses that might have been told about this plan. Investigators quickly discovered that just after Sheila's family had moved to Sarasota, leaving no forwarding address, Blackthorne methodically began tracking her down. 
phone records showed that he made repeated calls to the San Antonio bail bond company that had issued Sheila's bond after her child abuse arrest that summer. He was trying to ascertain uh, Sheila's address by pretending to be somebody else. Blackthorne was not aware that the conversations were being recorded. Yes, ma'am. You folks have a bond on a Sheila Bellish for okay. $5,000. Well, I can't release that information. I don't know who you are. Okay, what, what I'm trying to figure out is that, well, I'm somebody that they owe money to and they skipped out of state on me. Phone records indicated that Blackthorne had hired a private investigator in Florida to locate his ex-wife. They also showed that two weeks before Sheila Bellish's murder, he had gotten a call from their 12-year-old daughter, Daryl. He's like, oh, well, where do you live? And I'm like, well, I can't tell you that. He's like, why not? I'm like, because my mom doesn't want me to tell you. According to Daryl, her father said he wanted to come visit them over the holidays. That was enough to persuade her to reveal the family's whereabouts. I told him where we lived. He's like, okay, well, I can't wait till Christmas come see you, and then never heard from him again. Even with the evidence they'd found against Blackthorn, prosecutors faced an uphill battle without the corroborating testimony of Danny Rocha. Rocha was a gambler by nature and by trade. With no steady job, he supported his family by taking illegal bets on sporting events. Danny always made it seem as if he was involved in something suspicious, you know? He always had that kind of demeanor. Rocha had met Alan Blackthorne in 1996 when the millionaire businessman was looking for a high-stakes golf game. Alan made no bones about the fact that he was a golf gambler, and Rocha made no bones about the fact that he was a golf hustler. And he laughed, as a matter of fact, about how much money he used to take from Alan. To authorities, Rocha was the key witness. The only person who could directly link Blackthorne to Sheila's murder. I don't have a copy. But Rocha wasn't playing ball. He wouldn't tell investigators anything, unless prosecutors agreed to a severely reduced sentence. He wanted what we call a sweetheart deal. He believed that because he was the direct connection to Allen, he could plea bargain for a very, very low number of years to serve. But as time passed, Rocha grew increasingly bitter that he was in jail, and Alan Blackthorne was still free, as he made clear in this interview with a Tampa TV station. Here, I'm trying to do the right thing, and, and I'm trying to make a deal, and, and, you know, he's back here in San Antonio, uh, you know, playing golf five days a week. Prosecutors did have one powerful weapon against Rocha, his buddy Sammy Gonzalez's confession. They charged Rocha with conspiring to commit murder, even as his plea negotiations continued. On January 12th, 1999, Rocha's trial began in Sarasota. Two days later, he folded his hand. In a last-ditch attempt to avoid life behind bars, he told investigators he would talk. There's a saying in Spanish, that is uh, las últimas patadas de un hogado, which literally translates to the last kicks of a drowning victim. In January 1999, two days into his trial for plotting to kill Sheila Bellish, San Antonio bookie Danny Rocha struck a deal with prosecutors. In exchange for a reduced sentence, he would testify that he had been hired by the victim's ex-husband, Alan Blackthorne. At the Sarasota County Jail on January 14th, Rocha sat down with authorities and gave his version of the murder conspiracy. It all started, he said, in July 1997, when Blackthorne took him on a golfing trip to Oregon. It was there, Rocha claimed, that the millionaire first approached him about hiring someone to beat up his ex-wife. According to Rocha, Blackthorne's aim soon escalated from injuring her to killing her. Danny would tell us through his conversation with us, Alan that, uh, you know, if they beat her up, she could die, Alan. And uh, Alan's response, so be it. Rocha said he solicited his friend, 
Sammy Gonzalez, to make the hit. But there was a problem. Once Sammy found out that the target was going to be a woman, he backed down and said, I, I can't do this to a woman. Joey Del Toro, Gonzalez's cousin, was instead enlisted to carry out the hit. Rocha said that three days before the murder, he met with Gonzalez and Del Toro at the Pan American Golf Club in San Antonio to seal the deal. Rocha told Del Toro he would get $4,000 if he mutilated Sheila Bellish and $10,000 more if he killed her. Del Toro accepted and drove to Florida on his own. And there goes Joey. Does his deed and comes all the way back. And then the whole house starts falling in. When Rocha was finished, detectives moved quickly to make sure his story checked out. They were able to corroborate much of it through evidence they had already uncovered. But then they hit a snag. Recounting the plot for prosecutors, Rocha embellished his story enough to fail a polygraph test. Exasperated, the state declared its deal with Rocha null and void and refused to negotiate on his sentence. His trial continued, and on January 15th, 1999, the jury handed down its verdict. He, the jury, find as follows as to count one of the charges. The defendant is guilty of principle to murder in the first degree. He was sentenced to life in a Florida state prison. He could have had the same deal Sammy had if he would have cooperated early on, but like he said himself, he's a gambler. He rolled the dice and lost. Alan Blackthorne, however, appeared to have won. Without the testimony of Danny Rocha, Florida prosecutors were forced to shelve their case against him due to a lack of evidence. Blackthorne, meanwhile, was mounting an all-out PR campaign to clear his name. In July 1999, he gave an interview to a Florida news program, insisting he had nothing to hide. Everybody has said, oh, why is he staying so quiet? Why didn't he talk to the media? Why didn't he do this? I mean, if I come out and talk to the media, am I sly and slick? Or if I stay quiet, am I uh, shy and hiding? Guilty and hiding? Blackthorne contended that he would never have robbed Stevie and Daryl of Sheila. She was my daughter's mother. I'd already given up my parental rights. Who did she, who did those girls have left? In San Antonio, federal prosecutors were paying close attention to Blackthorne and his public statements. It was offensive that this uh, man who, who so apparently was involved and was responsible for the killing of this woman uh, was so arrogant. After exploring their options, prosecutors decided their best bet was a 1994 statute called the Violence Against Women Act. The law made it a federal crime to commit domestic abuse across state lines. This meant that the inconsistencies in Danny Roach's story would become less important to a successful prosecution. He had given various stories over the year and a half or so up till then. But under every version, uh, Blackthorne was involved. Blackthorne was the cause of the act. Rocha, now serving life, agreed to testify. He hoped to be considered for a reduced sentence in exchange for his testimony linking Blackthorne to Sheila's murder. Rocha technically gave the authorities a case. In other words, liar or not, he said, Alan Blackthorne hired me to do this. On January 4th, 2000, more than two years after Sheila's death, Alan Blackthorne was charged with interstate domestic violence, as well as conspiracy to commit murder for hire. When law enforcement was finally ready to put the cuffs on him, they knew exactly where to go, the golf course. He just had that arrogance about him, that he can't touch me, you're never gonna get me. We did. On June 12, 2000, one week after his 45th birthday, Alan Blackthorne's trial began at the United States Federal Courthouse in San Antonio, Texas. 
Blackthorne stood accused of arranging the murder of his ex-wife, 35-year-old Sheila Bellish. He had been charged with interstate conspiracy to commit murder for hire and interstate domestic violence. Both charges carried a maximum sentence of life in prison. Assistant U.S. Attorney John Murphy led the prosecution's case. That poor woman was butchered, and four 23-month-old babies wandered around their dead mother for probably six hours. It was horrendous. In his opening statement, Murphy sought to give jury members something he believed they needed to hear, a motive. He had lost the final battle when he relinquished his parental rights to those children. He told Danny, that bitch thinks she can outsmart me, but I'm going to show her. Again, demonstrating not only his hatred for her, but his lack of capacity to accept any kind of loss. He could not lose. The prosecution began by playing a tape of the 911 call made by the victim's teenage daughter, Stevie Bellish, when she discovered her mother's body. <laughs> okay, stay on one. Are your brothers and sisters younger than you? <laughs> Imagine yourself being in her shoes. You know, you come home, your mother's on the floor, kitchen floor with blood all over. Soon after, the state called to the stand its problematic star witness, Danny Rocha was serving a life sentence for his part in the murder conspiracy. For hours, Rocha told the jurors of the plot outlined during his golf trip with Blackthorne in July 1997. He detailed how Blackthorne initially solicited him to mutilate Bellish, not kill her. He didn't want it just to be a beating. He wanted her to be tortured. He wanted her back broken. He wanted her tongue cut out. Rocha then explained how the plot came to involve two others, Sammy Gonzalez and Joey Del Toro, and how the $4,000 beating grew into the $14,000 murder. Alan said, the best way to do it is if the body is never found. Tell them to bury her in the woods, dump her in the ocean, or feed her to the alligators. That only means one thing, kill her. Rocha's testimony was powerful. But it was also riddled with inconsistencies. Rocha had lied over and over again. How can anybody rely upon this witness to send this man to prison for the rest of his life? A lot of jurors were going like, they better come with something else besides just this one guy. The defense used their cross-examination to introduce the crux of their argument, that Alan Blackthorne knew nothing about the murder plot and that it was Danny Rocha who had arranged the whole thing. Rocha, they claimed, was motivated by a desire to strengthen his lucrative friendship with Blackthorne and by Blackthorne's stories that his ex-wife had abused their children. Alan would complain that the children were being beaten and he felt terrible about it. And probably Rocha was thinking, if I can stop the beatings, Alan will love me. He was a schemer. And he had this idea that Alan Blackthorne was a very, very wealthy businessman and that Alan could be his ticket to, to financial success. Prosecutors responded by presenting evidence that after Sheila Bellish moved to Florida, Blackthorne had obsessively hunted her down. They introduced phone records that showed dozens of calls from Blackthorne to a Florida private eye. They also played the recorded telephone inquiries Blackthorne made to a bail bonds company during his search for Sheila. We had Alan's voice in this long telephone conversation telling all these outrageous lies. I'm just trying to figure out where out of state that they've run. Well, I don't know. We discuss anyone that would hurt a child. This is true. The defense countered that Blackthorne's lies to the bond agency were justified by his concern for his two daughters. If any of us felt that our kids were being physically abused, we'd lie to find out where they were so we could help them. Doesn't make him a murderer. But prosecutors pointed out that once Blackthorne learned where his ex-wife lived, he never spoke to his kids again, even after her murder. He was calling, calling, calling everywhere in Florida trying to find Sheila Bellish, and once he got that address, all the calls stopped. 
When the defense presented its side, a confident Alan Blackthorne was eager to testify. There was no way that Alan Blackthorne wasn't going to take the stand. He was innocent, and he wanted to tell the jury that he was innocent. Blackthorne denied any involvement in his ex-wife's murder. His demeanor during cross-examination surprised prosecutor John Murphy. A man who had a reputation for a terrible temper remained completely cool, calm, and collected. He turned to the jury, and he was so friendly and drawing them in as, as, you know, we're here together and we all see this is a fake case. On June 29th, 2000, the jury retreated for deliberations. It wasn't a slam dunk at all. And I remember wondering, are, is the jury going to buy this guy? After 33 hours, the jury returned with its verdict. There were two counts against Blackthorne interstate conspiracy to commit murder for hire and interstate domestic violence. The jury's verdict was the same on both counts. Guilty. His defense didn't hold any water and the prosecution's story did. This guy's guilty. I had no problem saying that. Still don't. I just kind of sat there and cried for a couple of hours because I knew it was finally over and done with and that everybody that needed to be was finally brought to justice. The 45-year-old millionaire was given two concurrent life sentences. The worst thing he could do to Alan Blackthorne is take away his golf game. And he's not playing golf now. On the same day as Blackthorne's verdict, any lingering doubts about his involvement in the crime seemed to be erased over a thousand miles away. You understand that the charge of murder in the first degree... That afternoon in Sarasota, Florida, Joey Del Toro pleaded guilty to the murder of Sheila Billish. It had taken more than a year to extradite him from Mexico. Now Sarasota detectives were finally able to hear Del Toro's version of the story. In a videotaped confession, the 24-year-old outlined the murder plot and confirmed Blackthorne's involvement once and for all. He thought that it, uh, the job was for Dan, but he said it was for somebody else. Uh, and, and I go, okay, so uh, I had asked him, you know, well, for who? For who? You know, and he says, well, I'm not supposed to tell you, but uh, it's for a guy named Alan Blackthorne. The words that I received were that it would be better if she was dead. I knew that he was the one behind the whole thing because his name was mentioned by Sammy, his name was mentioned by Danny, and I just knew it. Del Toro told authorities he was led to believe that Sheila was abusing her children. They just made it seem as if she was the horrible person, you know, and they made Alan Blackthorne seem like the innocent. The day of the murder, Del Toro said, he snuck into Sheila's house and watched her to see if what he'd been told was true. But what he saw was, quote, a loving, caring mother. I was about to leave when she noticed that the door was open. And I couldn't run, I couldn't do anything. And so, well. Joey Del Toro was sentenced to life in prison without parole. In the wake of Sheila's murder, her second husband, Jamie Bellish, and their quadruplets returned to his home state of New Jersey. Her teenage daughters, Daryl and Stevie, moved to Salem, Oregon to live with their aunt, Carrie Blador. How do kids ever get over losing both their mother and their father? Because truly, they did lose their father. I have nothing to do with him, and I kind of wish he'd just die, because I don't think he deserves to live anymore. Sheila's oldest daughter, Stevie, plans someday to visit her father in prison. I'm definitely not as bitter as I once was. It would be nice to be sitting on the opposite side of the glass. I think that would definitely be some humiliation for him. 
I'm constantly, even now, thinking about, you know, why? I don't, I don't really understand. After his sentencing, Alan Blackthorne was sent to the Beaumont Federal Penitentiary in Texas. Blackthorne will never be eligible for parole. We meet the bully of Toulon in tomorrow's all-new crime and punishment at the same time. But next, cops in Tucson get a surprise tip-off that leads to a manhunt, and time, as ever, is not on their side.